Tonight's top European Union stories from the Unit UK include Liberals confirm Guy Verhofstadt as nominee for European Commission President. India bans using animals to test household products. And secret Home Office dossier reveals thousands of EU migrants are cheating their way to benefits. A British business needs direction over EU reform. Plus, flooding, Somerset Level's disaster is being driven by EU policy. It's Thursday, 13th of February. Good to have you with us. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First up, the hot story from our website, theunituk.com. Liberals confirm Guy Verhofstadt as nominee for European Commission President. Former Belgian Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt has been confirmed as the European Liberal Party's candidate for President of the European Commission, ahead of European elections in May. Delegates of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, ALDE, approved the resolution by a majority of 80% at a meeting in Brussels on Saturday. Verhofstadt, who currently heads the party group in the European Parliament, is a committed federalist. His campaign will call for deeper political integration within the European Union. Now, the candidate lost no time in attacking one of the main dangers, as he sees it, at the European elections, Euro scepticism. We have to be very clear to public opinion that these populist and nationalist Euro skeptics have no solution for their problems. Look, if you want a future for your children on this continent, we need more Europe. We need an economic and fiscal union, a banking union, as fast as possible, Verhofstadt said. Well, not much you can say about that, really. I think he's made his position pretty clear. A single federal superstate with him as Lord, Master and Messiah. Next, he'll be wanting us all to wear the mark of the beast. India bans using animals to test household products. What do India and Israel have in common? They are the only two countries that ban using animals to test both cosmetics and household products. The European Union has made it illegal to sell cosmetics that were tested on animals, but has no similar restrictions on testing household products. The United States doesn't limit the testing of either kind of product, though some individual states do. The US also doesn't require animal tests for cosmetics, but that may change. There is a bill before Congress that would require every ingredient in cosmetics to undergo toxicity testing. Now, the European Union has banned using animals to test cosmetics and their ingredients. Individual companies have unilaterally announced that they will not test their products on animals, including Shasidu, The Body Shop and Lush. Now, it doesn't make sense that hurting and killing non-animal humans is the only way to find out whether a chemical will hurt human animals. It would be better if we created incentives for researchers to develop superior non-animal tests for these substances. Hopefully, India's new law will prove to be that kind of incentive. Secret Home Office dossier reveals thousands of EU migrants are cheating their way to benefits. A secret government report has revealed that thousands of migrants from the European Union have tried to claim British state handouts through bogus marriages and fraudulent welfare claims. Immigrants have also used false documents and lied about being related to EU citizens in order to cheat their way to the UK taxpayers' money, the unpublished Home Office report states. Now, criminal gangs have even smuggled people into Britain, forced them to open bank accounts so that they can claim benefits before taking the money and leaving them penniless and forced to beg on the streets, according to the dossier. The report, which has been seen by the Sunday Telegraph, has highlighted the exploitation of free movement, immigration rights given to EU citizens, allowing them to move anywhere within the EU to work. Now, it has prompted ministers into a five-year push to convince leaders in Brussels that the action must be taken to halt this abuse. The document, entitled Evidence of Fraud and Abuse of Free Movement in the UK, was submitted to the European Commission by Home Secretary Theresa May last year in response to a request for evidence of the scale of the abuse of the free movement rights. 
Well, it's pretty clear that folks across Europe are getting fed up with all this nonsense. This ethnic engineering is cracking along at full tilt, but the only people that are benefiting are the Euro Project kleptocrats. British business needs direction over EU reform. The start of the year has once again seen the row over Europe rear its ugly head. From speeches to signed letters, the Europhiles and Europhobes have played out their disagreements in front of the press. Now there is no doubt that renegotiation and reform of the EU is necessary, as the Chancellor George Osborne was right to point out, and the majority of businesses are determined to see a revamped relationship. But it has been a year since the Prime Minister first announced his intentions on Europe, and UK firms are no clearer as to what this means in practice. Look, let me help these folks clear up this confusion. Martin Schultz has said it. Vivian Redding has said it. Jose Barroso has said it. There will be no renegotiation of Britain's relationship within the EU. Well, not in the sense of greater veto powers and withdrawal from treaty obligations. Once Schultz or Verhofstadt are in place, then folks, that will be the final four years of endgame assimilation, and there ain't a darn thing Big Cheese Dave Cameroni or Georgie Porgy can do about it. Oh, what sweet sorrow. I feel a little poetic. A poem for Dave. What would it take for you to change your mind, Dave? What would it take for you to face the facts? A businessman working on a train. A benefit-cost ratio of less than two. Empty seats on the West Coast Main Line. And all for the good of wealthy tycoons rushing to visit London. None of these, it seems. What would it take for you to change your mind, Dave? What would it take for you to see the light? Hundreds of people's homes demolished. And thousands affected by blight. Farms and businesses wiped out. Dozens of ancient woodlands destroyed. The rape of the beautiful countryside. Carbon emissions on the rise. Unbearable noise for tens of thousands. None of these, it seems. What would it take for you to change your mind, Dave? What would it take for you to comprehend? HS1 is a similar beast. Disastrous in so many ways. Change should be now, not in 20 years. London will benefit, not the North, with many fewer services for towns and cities off the line, but none of these matters, it seems. What would it take for you to change your mind, Dave? What would it take for you to understand? Another 10 billion on the cost? No, 40 more says the Institute of Economic Affairs. Amber Red from the Major Projects Authority. A damning report from the National Audit Office. One grand folly, cries the Institute of Directors. We're not convinced, says the Public Accounts Committee. Serious shortcomings, insist the Treasury Select Committee. Ashcroft, Darling, Mandelson, Balls, can they all be so easily ignored? A blinkered view is nothing to be proud of, refusing to look at the facts and preferring fantasy. For HS2 is holy vanity. So what would it take for you to change your mind, David Cameron and George Osborne, Patrick McLaughlin, Nick Clegg and Ed Miliband? Yes. What would it take for you to change your mind? Flooding, Somerset Level's disaster is being driven by EU policy. Here's a cracking article on the flooding of the Somerset Levels, with clear, concise evidence of why this has been a controlled urban inundation at the hands of EU kleptocrat policy. But what has been emerging in recent days is another hugely important factor in bringing this disaster about. The extent to which the agency's policy has been shaped and driven by the European Union. My co-author, Dr Richard North, an 
expert researcher who writes the EU referendum blog, has been combing through dozens of official documents to unravel just how it was that the agency came to adopt a strategy deliberately designed to allow flooding, not just in Somerset, but elsewhere in the country, all in the name of putting the interests of biodiversity, sustainability and wildlife habitats above those of farming and people. Now these have included the EU's Natura 2000 strategy, along with a sheaf of directives on habitats, birds, water and not least the floods directive of 2007, which specifically requires certain floodplains to be allowed to flood. In 2008, when the Environment Agency was run by Baroness Young, this was reflected in a policy document which classified areas at risk of flooding under six categories, ranging from those in Policy Option 1, where flood defences were a priority, down to Policy 6, where to promote biodiversity, the strategy should be to increase flooding. The Somerset levels were covered by Policy 6. Now, this article written by Christopher Booker is first class and a must read. We'll be taking the nightly news offline next week during the half term for critical maintenance. As you are already aware, we have been plagued by technical issues and problems. We have cobbled and patched together as much as we can. And now we really need to take this opportunity to iron out the wrinkles and get things working seamlessly. Of course, the latest updates and news will be available on our website. And the team and I shall be back with the nightly news on Monday, the 24th of February. Remember to visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, all one word. Or join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions and post comments about our stories and even get involved in the shows. For all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter, at The E Unit. I'm... Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon.